Well, welcome everyone. This is a spontaneous podcast with my dear friend, Rima Bonario, and she is the Queen's Code coach, and a lot of her work is around sovereignty. So we were just jamming on relationships and feminine reclamation and womb work and how that is that in the feminine is waking up a part of the feminine that is no longer even able to tolerate certain things inside of old contracts, old sacred contracts, old relationships. So we were like, oh, this is such a juicy conversation. We should bring it out to everyone. So anyway, welcome, Rima. I'm glad that you punted and you're here. Thank you so much, Kimlin. It's, uh, you know, these, these are fun times, <laughs> fun times for all. And I think it's, you know, for me personally, I really enjoy being in the conversation with other women that are tracking these things. It helps me understand myself better. It helps me understand my role better. It helps me be a better support person, teacher, guide, facilitator for others. So thanks for calling the circle. Yeah, because I think things don't make sense right now, <laughs> at least to our brain that has been wired from before and it's getting rewired. God, all the eclipses we've been through, I think are rewiring our brains. Um, and yeah, things are changing. So we do need to be in the conversation to update the files and get a get a reality check of, you know, I mean, I when my women in my group say, Am I going crazy? <laughs> yeah, it feels that way. It, it, I think Barbara Marks Hubbard, who I studied with many years ago, talked a lot about we're in this moment where we have this incredible explosion and expansion and evolution happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. There is this precipitous devolution going on and this destruction going on. And, and you know, where is that leading? And we can feel crazy, you know, because what, which is real, what is really happening? And it's all happening. They're both happening. And in any moment in your life, you can be feeling it like you're evolving. And then two minutes later, you can be experiencing yourself coming apart and coming undone. And, and it, it, it's a lot to hold on our own. We, we're not actually designed to hold it on our own. Mm, well, let's talk some about that. You know, what you're saying is like the polarities are getting wider with that devolution. And we can see that the patriarchy particularly is really fighting for its right to exist and the, the right to continue to run the planet, to run the planet into the ground, to extract, to get more and more and more. And then at the same time, we've got this spiritual awakening, and I'm going to say the rise of the feminine. And yeah, so let's talk about first, you said that we're really not meant to hold it all. What do you mean by that? How, what is your experience of that? We're, we're not meant to hold it all alone. Mm. So, the, and that's really the piece that, that there's a, one of the things that patriarchy demands is a, a type of toxic isolationism or individualistic view. And, and it's all about what the self can do. Yeah. And the self is king. Um, and it's not, so it, it's not that it has it wrong, that, that the self has value. That, that's important because part of the reaction that came about during the Age of Enlightenment, which is sort of flipped this particular version of of uh, patriarchy on uh, into our sphere was a reaction against this way that our individual nature was not being acknowledged our individual value was not being acknowledged and you know we were just you know useless chattel for whoever and so the next round of that happened and a group of you know sort of empowered really merchants came in and said, we're not going to do that anymore. We want power in the people. But of course, their version of the people was this slice, right? The next layer down. So really, we have a country that was established by the merchants for the merchants, not really by the people for the people, because that was who the people were at the time. 
So this is sort of individualistic way of approaching life is a hallmark. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can move across your class. It doesn't matter. It's a Horatio Alger story. But that's only true for mm. a small collective of people. And what's starting to happen is the actual seeding of that belief mm. has been useful because the rest of the world is going, well, wait, what about me? I want to do that, too. I want to have that freedom, too. Women want to have their voice. People of color want to have their voice. People who are not landed gentry want to have their voice. You know, all of that's been great. And the danger has been that we buy into this sort of individualistic approach. Well, you're getting yours, so I'm going to get mine too. And now all of us are just jumping onto that side of the of the boat and the boat is starting to sink. Hmm. Yeah, it so, is. I mean, I, I say it this way, you have to be a self in order to be no self. And that teaching I got when I was with a brain guy who, and on my spiritual path, and I wanted to bypass the self part and just be enlightened because the self part was so painful. Yeah. But I ultimately went on a journey of the self part. And so there's this paradox inside of what you're pointing to. And I, and I want to bring it into this astrological conversation that I just did a video the other day on the North Node in Aries. And your North Node is in Aries, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're in your I'm node. For a return. return here very soon, yeah. Yeah. And so Aries is definitely about the individual and the self. And it's juxtaposing the South Node in Libra, the people, the relationships, relating other so we're in this kind of really bizarre time. And I said this too, that we're also encapsulating all of it with the Aquarian age, which is about community, even though it could be, it could be like more cold because Aquarius is a sign that is not known for its warmth. It's more known for its technology, but we're still talking community. And so inside community, we got to learn how to get along. And the way we're going to do it is by being a self fully expressed yeah and and a self in relationship yeah right that's the piece where i was saying we're not designed to, to hold it alone so we we have that self and then we have others and and this idea of developing relational mastery and relational presence and relational capacity is essential and that's that feels more like the feminine energy right because it's about connection and um the the what's been missing and this is really up for me right now personally is the recognition that the traumas that we're seeking to heal from both individually and collectively are relational traumas yeah and so the the healing has to come inside of relationship and it and it and it doesn't matter it, it doesn't matter we can't be the it's about me only just about me so when we have this impulse of the no to say yes it's about individual expression we we want to do that from the place of seeing that I have to have a self, right, as you just said, in order to move into the place of the relationship with what else is there. Um, and, and it's tricky. It's tricky because codependency has been something that I've just spent a lifetime working on. My, my family just is a black belt in, in that, um, multiple versions of codependency. And so where do I watch myself? give up what I know is my truth, what I know are the places where I need to say no, where I know are the places where I need to put in a very firm and loving boundary. Where do I fail to do that and pay attention to myself because I'm, I'm afraid actually of the loss of the love or the relationship. And, and that is actually not relational mastery at all. That is not being in an enlightened version of myself at all. It's a hiding. It's a, it's a, it's an illness, really, frankly, mm -hmm. and it doesn't allow for a clear and authentic and real and transparent form of relational health to occur. 
because I'm not being truthful. I'm not being honest and I'm not being in trust. You know, that's why I think in the cosmic intelligence, you know, how I relate to the North Node in Aries is that it's perfect because that is the lesson right there because the Libra South Node's ruling this codependency and that's just been an insidious way that we have almost all of us have related. And I think relationship gets that way because there is that bond that mimics the parent and child. And when that, that intense bond is there, the fear of loss is there. And then we go into these extraordinarily complex coping mechanisms to keep the other person, which could have things like, I won't speak my truth. And, and then maybe the masculine, which I've seen more of is I'll distance myself because it's not safe to be yeah, right. so, vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so th- there's the yoga that we've had as a culture. And I sort of see the, the intelligence of, okay, we've got to really learn who we are and what is true for us? I mean, I didn't know the answer to that. Did you know the answer? I mean, I, I didn't grow up knowing that. I, we, I had no feedback and I had no idea of what my truth was. Right, right. So, so we've got these two, one set of polarities, which you're talking about is the boundarylessness side and the other polarity is the walled off side. And, and then we have another set of polarities. This is actually Terry Reel's work. If somebody wants to look it up, he's got a really beautiful map about this, that down below is shame. I don't know, you know who I am is, is bad. And up above is grandiosity. Who I am is superior. Mm-hmm. And, and we have um, struggled with, you know, where do we land in those quadrants where we really kind of want to be centrally, centrally located not one down, not one up, not walled off and not without boundaries. And so this this thing that I'm seeing happening, it's happening for me personally, I'm seeing it in a lot of my clients and students, um, is this tension between when we begin to notice that we're losing ourselves and how we we've you know we're we're collectively getting it that we can't raise, we can't continue to raise children in a place of shame but we're elevating them into this place of grandiosity. And the question you posed about where do I find the feedback? Did I get feedback growing up that allowed me to know my truth? Well, most of us did not because most of us were being told what the truth was going to be for us. And if our parents were unhealed, which, you know, I mean, we're talking about millennia of of trauma that just continues to roll downhill that, You best be all the things children should be seen and not heard, blah, blah, all of that of like the squishing of the self and and not providing a space to say, oh, honey, I I see you're not wanting to eat your peas today. Tell me more about that. What's going on for you? (laughs) Like, you know, and and then we've had over the last several decades, a kind of a pendulum swing that's overdone this indulgence. Yeah. Of, oh, you don't want peas? Don't, no problem. Here, try this. No problem. Here, try this. And then mom is just, she's just like, it's the little tyrant at the beck and call of the mom. And then there's no structure. There's no loving firmness that says, okay, this is, this is how we share space together. This is how we behave together. That, that place of a loving set of boundaries. And that's equally as damaging. Mm-hmm. Maybe it doesn't look like so on the outside, but it can be equally damaging and disorienting for the child as to what, how, where do I fit in here? There's no, there's nowhere to go in here that makes sense to me. So, yeah, you know, the Hoffman anything? process, well, the, just to interject, the Hoffman process says that those kids that had no boundaries end up feeling neglected. Crazy that that's how they metabolize that experience. Yeah, yeah, there was a great, years ago, I read M. Scott Peck, and he talked about this, and, you know, he said, children don't, you know, they they want their way, they want you to say yes, but even more than they want that, they want you to consider what they're asking, 
Mm. And if you pause and consider what they're asking for and think about it and give them a, a thoughtful response, you know, I really see you want this. And I thought about it and inside of what we have available right now, we, I cannot say yes to you on this. A child will feel loved by that. Mm. will feel more loved by that than the automatic yes or the automatic no. Mm. Mm. Bam. So, so that's it. That's where we are inside of our relationships, even with our others, our romantic relationships, our relationship with the world. Are we considering what we're being asked to mm. do, to live, to how to be together? Or are we offloading it in the automatic yes or the automatic no? Because we don't want either to take the time to be in thoughtful consideration or we, we want to avoid a conflict or yeah. we just feel superior. I don't have time for this. Yeah, autopilot is something we get to wake up from on all levels. So tell me how, if you want to share or to the extent you want to share, how are you noticing that this conversation is coming up for you? I mean, this is your nodal return. So this is your lesson. I just had mine. I it is it is so intense to get the lesson of that node, but like we're here, we're, we're pulling for you. We're going to, we're going to help you do it. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I need that. So I had two things occur for me in this starting into last fall, really for the the last half of last year. And they're still unfolding now where I had experiences that I could tell something was off with two people, very important people in my life that I spent the majority of my time with. And I being a good shadow practitioner and a good teacher of how to excavate my own unconscious biases and heal my own inner wounding, did my work. And when I went in and did my work, where I arrived at was, okay, I can take care of my wounded self about this. My wounded self doesn't need to be offended by this or hurt by this. My my wounded self, I can take care of her. So now I can be in my magnanimous self and just be patient and just wait, which actually is wasn't my wise self. It was an adaption. So mm-hmm. I, I processed myself out of the truth that my body was feeling, that mm-hmm. something was off. And I waited and I waited and I waited until in one case, the explosion occurred, the other person had a betrayal. And that just touched off a whole nother round of, okay, now we, I can really see what's going on here. And in the second case, the, the, it just became so clear that I needed to speak up and say something. And when I did, what I discovered was the thing I was tracking was absolutely accurate almost to the day of when I could feel it went off. Yeah. And it was such a learning for me about how, um, my spiritual ego hmm. is still a, a ch- is a is a challenge for me. I have to watch that that part of myself hmm. uh, and learn to trust and at least be willing to ask the questions. Hey, I'm kind of feeling this, and I don't have to do it from my wounded child. You know, like that was right and important for me to do that work. But then to circle back around and not be afraid of what I might hear and say, hey, this is what this is what I'm noticing. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm wondering. Let, can I check this out with you? What's happening here? Now, the, the good news is that when the veil is pulled back and we can actually see what's really there, then we have the opportunity to transform, to actually transcend, to actually be in conscious choice, to do the heavy lifting of how did I get here? How did we get here? What were the things that got missed? What are the things that need to be adjusted? And if we're skilled enough and we have enough support, we can do that with love. And and this is, comes all the way back to my point, which is that I was trying to get that figured out by myself. Mm, yeah. And 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 so I wasn't in relational mastery there. I was trying to be in self mastery. And, you know, we talk a whole lot right now about the need for us to learn how to regulate our nervous systems and do our shadow work and all that's true. But all regulation really is co-regulation. We we think we're separate, but quite honestly, our brains are social structures. There's really no 
difference. Like our brains are constantly interacting with other brains. Our nervous systems are constantly interacting with other nervous systems. So no matter how much you think you're doing it on your own, you're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's profound. Yeah. So let's go back to that moment where you worked on everything yourself. You got to this place where you dissolved the trigger, it sounds like. Was there was there something in you that you can track now that was afraid to have a voice in that moment? Yeah, I, it, for me, it partly um, slides into this really yucky place from my um, family of origin, which is uh, the martyr place. Mm. I'm like, oh, I will be the better one. I will be the sacrificial one in my work. It's the sacrificial queen. You know, I will like, like this idea of not having modeled for me, healthy love, healthy, loving structures. So love looks for me like, you know, laying down and, you know, walk all over me and, and then when it comes out that all these things happen i get to feel superior and wow is that it's so awful to see you know that i i was in one case i was um which was was a person who had been a student and had been uh was working with me and um is younger than me and i just sort of was aware of what was happening for that person and wanted to hold space for that person and you know sort of be the thing Mm -hmm. with forgetting that that part of my obligation in any relationship is to be fully there which means i bring myself into it as well and i get to use the information that's coming into my body Mm -hmm. and into my knowing and into my intuition Mm -hmm. to be present in that relationship. This has been a lifelong learning for me, this dance of just like when to yield, you know, does it really, you you gave that wonderful example in your transmission about the socks on the floor. Does it really, is it really true? The socks need to be picked up, you know? Okay, so, so on one spectrum, we have the socks, the dirty dishes in the sink. On the other spectrum, we have less than how do we really, really want to share space together in a way that is conscientious? And to me, the difference here is that I don't have to lose my shit over the socks being on the floor and then come at you in this really unforgiving, unhealthy way. I can still, though, have a preference and a desire and even set a boundary and say, look, this is how we're going to share space together. This is what we are going to be doing here in this home. You know, when we're, when we're training our children, we want to be able to do that. We want to be able to give them those skills. It gets a little trickier and dicier when we're dealing with other human beings that are adults. And even how we do it with our kids, we don't want to tread on other people's sovereignty. This yeah. is, this is the, this is, I think, the dynamic of our day, right? Like this, this is the nodes, but it's also the um, Aquarius and Leo is on the opposite end of the spectrum there, right? So, so sovereignty and community, right? How we're working this out as a, it is the time of the next 2000 years. This is all we're going to be doing. And it's so messy. So we get to really just acknowledge and, and you know, I what I hear in your share, I'm just like, ah, oh, don't even beat yourself up because this shit's supposed to be messy. We don't know. We are just moving into an age of consciousness that we we never had the luxury in, in our childhood, our upbringing, our parents of conscious communication of really knowing who we are and then speaking from that truth. But that rub is so interesting. I have a friend whose husband tolerates a lot of things inside their relationship that he doesn't like. And I have noticed it and, and I met, I said something about it And what I realized, what he said back was like his principle of uh, his value of the principle of autonomy and sovereignty is so large that he constantly overrides his own needs. And I thought that was fascinating because then he shows up kind of as a bully. 
So we all have these like intricate, you know, intricate ways. And, and for me, I'm, I like to just observe because it's very much easier for me to see <laughs> playing out on the stage in front of me than in my own life. And when I observe that, I think, oh, he's not a bully. He's angry as fuck at, at denying his own needs by pedestalizing someone else's needs. And when you shared that about like you were caretaking a student, because that's what your training is, that's what your role in the world is, holding space and and being that wise teacher and then forsaking over here, there's a need and the truth and something that needs to be spoken. I think you're really hitting the nail on the head of a of a vibration that that we are we're needing to clean up as a mm -hmm. collective, mm -hmm. because the cost of it, you know, like I saw the cost of it in that family is that the truth isn't really being spoken. So there's not actually the harmony. And I'll say one more thing and then I'll toss the baton, but early, my very first personal growth book ever, no one will believe this, but I went to a bookstore back in the day and I was breaking down and I looked at all the books, I looked at them and I pulled off the shelf a book called Passionate Marriage. And it was by a man named David Schnarch and he is, was a sex therapist. That was literally the only book I bought, my first book. And, and what drew me to it was really this attachment style stuff. He never called it that, it wasn't popular at the time. But he said something like intimacy, a couple of things, intimacy is the oh shit experience. Mm -hmm. so I learned a little bit about why I didn't want to be intimate, <laughs> like real intimacy. Um, but then he also said, he said something else. And he said, when he has couples in his office and they finally speak the truth, they go home and have the best sex ever because he's like, the truth is hot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and alive, the truth is alive. And what we're doing when we're not speaking the truth is we're burying our aliveness for mm. the sake of stability right. and and safety. And in, and it's a mirage because there the only true safety is building resiliency and mastery to ride the waves of of conflict to ride the waves of what's called harmony disharmony repair and then you know moving back into harmony again right and restoration and and we're lazy creatures in that we want to be asleep and actually you know what i'm beginning to rethink that what i really think is happening is that inside of our patriarchal systems and the ways that we've harnessed ourselves to productivity we no longer have the space and mm -hmm. the place at to and the freedom, the inner stillness to mm -hmm. feel alive, mm -hmm. to feel alive to the beauty of life and the messiness of life. It's uncomfortable. We don't have time for that. So yeah. we have to numb, we have to numb ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we numb ourselves with just let me just get it, let me just get it figured out. Let me just get it figured out. This is how it's gonna be. So uh so then we can be we can be numb, we can be asleep. And when you look out at the world, when I when I the, I often find myself looking at people like surfers and um, you know young people who just decided they're not buying into the they're just not buying into it. They're just not going to become a cog in the wheel. And there's something really alluring about that for me. Like I look at that and I have this wistful thought of like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to just drop out? Well, I don't know that that's the answer either, but they're they're tracking something. They're tracking this piece of fierce dedication to what's alive, what's in the moment. And this is, this is again, these polarities we're talking about, about how I had the conversation with my daughter just the other day about how much planning do you do and how much spontane spontaneity do you create space for, you know, in, and she was thinking maybe it had to do with the place you were at in your life. And I said, yeah, it's, maybe that's very true. And maybe that's just something we're working out our whole lives. You know, these are not problems to be solved. They're 
experiences to be lived and managed and surfed. I like that. I like the analogy of surfing. We need to surf. And listen, I include myself in this continually. I get tired and I, I don't want to surf anymore. I just want to have it done. And part of that comes because my life is too full and I, and I, and I, I don't, I don't go walk. And I don't, I don't, you know, I'm doing that now, but you know, I, I'm, I'm not living the way that I would really like to live to have enough bandwidth to just be able to surf. Mm. You know, if we don't, if we don't have enough room and, and buffer, we can't get it wrong, so to speak. There's not, there's not a, enough space to wait for the right, uh, the right wisdom to arise we need to make a decision now if there's not buffer around in our in our financial life to see well let me pr try this and see if it's good and if it's not good i'll go over here so instead it you know it's just being forced we just force ourselves forward and that doesn't give space to be to be present yeah i think that's where the feminine really gets to come into its genius in our culture. And that's one of the things when I talk about evolutionary feminine leadership that, that I want to see happen. Like I'm dedicating my life to bringing some of this feminine energy to the table, integrating it with the beautiful masculine structures that we have, that, that built what we have, that make things easy and possible. But now we really get to truly live it. It just feels like we, as you mentioned, we just haven't been able to live inside of it. And there's a movement around productivity that at least I'm dialed into recently and by accident, I don't, I didn't go seeking this out, but people were, uh, some of the advice that I've received is that giving myself that white space actually makes me more productive mm -hmm. than this kind of frenetic do, do, do. Um, and as, and as I build a company, I have a lot on my list, but I have noticed that when I take the morning and I go walk the labyrinth, for example, I have one at a local church near me. It doesn't even take that long, but that kind of a uh, homage to, I can't even start my day without mm -hmm. tuning in uh, and not as a place of like, oh, I have to just do my mantras and do my yoga and stretch my body because that we can all get so caught up in the to do's of our, that of self-care, but really truly as a channel to listen, to pray, to listen, um, to seek guidance. I feel like the problems that we're encountering, I can say for me personally in doing, in building a business where the old structures are blowing the fuck up and then the new is not here. I have to listen so deeply because I'm in, I feel like I'm in two worlds and yeah, it's become kind of part of my quote productivity to, to do those things. And that for me is how the feminine can make a huge difference to the way that we do our culture. Have you found that any of that is where your body wants to go? I mean, what, what, what's been happening in your life as you unwind from that pattern of busyness? I'm really, really feeling that as you're describing it. And it's, uh, for me, it's, I've been on that path for a number of years and it comes away in layers. You know, it started with, uh, I will do an anointing practice in the morning when I when I will anoint myself with essential oils, and then it became, uh, oh, I'm I'm going to dress and beautify myself and adorn myself as part of my feminine practice. You know, these were practical things, and I had to do it anyway, so why not elevate it, right? And then it became, wait a minute, I actually need to sit and pray. Mm -hmm. and light some sage and lay down on my sheepskin that's right here in front of you know and and oh wait no i actually need to be outside walking you know and so it's been funny to watch that at first it was you know okay i could give myself 15 minutes and then you know as my daughter's got out of her early school age years again a little longer and now she's off at college now it's just me so 
me deciding when I show up at my desk and it's stretched, you know, to almost like three hours when I'm really giving myself the time and uh, but bathing, taking a sacred bath, walking, praying, adorning, like all the things. And I have found it to be very true what you say that when I'm creating from that place of ease and connection to my essential self and a sense of communion with my spiritual knowing with my soul what i create is far more profound it happens in far less time it's twice as good and i have far more joy and it serves better and and i am here to tell you that every day still i mean maybe one day it won't be this way but every day i still have to face the inner voice an inner hurdle that says you don't have time for that. Yeah. Your email is waiting for you. Your text, like I, you know, you know, I had to draw a line. I do not look at email before noon, and I'm not always doing that. So, so I'm still playing around with bringing mm. my sacred masculine in to protect my feminine, which mm. is this spacious, flowing kind of energy. Um, I need my masculine as a protector and a container for for that to to actually say no no Rima you're not going to pick up your phone and do that you're going to do your practices honey that's what you need to do go do those things mm. and it, it's still it's still very hard and I'm I'm not perfect at it by any means and I can feel what a difference just that intention and and if I'm doing it at seventy percent or sixty percent I'm like Yay. I mean, that's so much better than I've ever done it before. Mm, you're such a goddess. <laughs> you're such a queen. I just love you. Let's Okay. Yeah. So we got a few minutes left. We're, we're going to circle back to this and then we'll complete our conversation. I want to circle back to relating because that's really where my work is taking me. And I, I suspect that is true for you. I mean, it's not crazy, but oh, I do a lot of work as you do in the sovereignty queen showing up, be your true self. And I started to get the codes of evolutionary feminine leaders are not just that we are more. And the more is the relating the power in the relating. And I was given a few instances in my life as I look back and they, they were examples. I didn't really embody this all the time, but they were examples of, for example, like I saw a guy hit his dog. I was on a walk and I saw him hit his dog. He was coming my way. And when I walked up to the guy, I said, did I just see you hit your dog? And that question gave me an entry point that if I would have come up and said, asshole, don't hit your dog, would have never done. But it was a spontaneous question. There was nothing in me that censored or tried to do it. I just said, did I see you hit your dog? And from there, he took the ball and he ran with it. And he's like, I did. And it's because he bit me and I shouldn't do that. And I'm like, you know, he was like doing the whole thing. I didn't, I just had to be witness there. And I look back at that of, holy shit, that is so much feminine power right there. And what I loved about it is as a do-gooder and as someone who likes to fix things, I don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was just there doing it. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. would just be wow. like, yeah, have you got training? Yeah, but I should get training, you know, the conversation. So, and, and then at the end, he actually thanked me. And that's happened multiple times. So I want to kind of tee that off and leave it like, how can we support people in these small ways right now as we are moving into this very messy thing? Because we either underdo something or we overdo it. And so I've underdone my voice and now I'm going to overdo my voice, but we are going to come back into this place of that pendulum where we're, we have like options now of who we want to be and how we want to come across and what kind of change we want to make. And that's what I'm a stand for. So any little thing that you can point to, to get us there. I, for me, the answer is in um, 
over in in rejecting and moving away from the training that I had in outrage, in judgment, in um, superiority or inferiority, and the and you came to that person and asked for clarification in a non-judgmental way. Now he could have been he could have still reacted badly, but he didn't. And because you you came in a in a way where you were asking for information rather than making an assessment, right? So when when we're in the relational space and this can be so hard when we're flooded emotionally, we rely on the things we were trained in. And I was trained in contempt. You know, contempt was the order of the day. And so, in, and I have to be building the muscle of kindness rather than contempt, of non-judgment rather than criticism and judgment, of um, recognizing that the person in front of me is someone that I love or like or would like to love or like or as a human being and deserves respect. So whatever those old little monster habits are, and, and I'm here to tell you that withdrawing and isolating and punishing people silently is also contempt. It doesn't have to just be an explosion. A shutting down is actually a self-contempt and shaming the self is a self-contempt. So whatever it is, whichever direction it goes, in, out, it's it's not helpful. So when it comes to coming back into relational mastery, that's the answer. And and so we we can be in our hearts. And as women, we we need to move into our wombs. We need to move into our wombs as the place from which life is birthed. And there's a there's an immediacy of connection when we can do that. And I'm only recently understanding the womb as a third organ, fourth organ of perception. And it's, I'm just now really, really getting it, that that is a massive, powerful, potent organ of perception that's in my body. I, I've spent my, most of my life in my brain, and then I discovered my heart, and suddenly, oh my God, I have a gut that's a powerful organ of perception. And you know what? My womb trumps them all. And I'm still learning how to listen and become conversant in the language of my my gut and my womb. And that, I think, is what you're speaking to, where the feminine just arose in you, and you knew instinctively how you could meet this person and speak up and say, I see what's happening without it being without it being a judge, judge, judgmental do-gooding, I'm going to shame you, and all the calling out stuff that we do that doesn't actually lead to transformation or self-inquiry at all. It just, it just puts people in oppositional stance. Yeah. And in that situation, I didn't know this person, so I wasn't being flooded with emotions, although I have a very uh, strong love of dogs and do not think anyone should hit dogs. But I knew that if I were going to be successful, I would have to come at it in a different way because he would go home with his dog and I would never know what would happen. So that, that I, I, I do acknowledge that that happened. And I'm also not a stranger to contempt at all. I was, I was fed that for breakfast when I was a kid. So I mean, I'm just eat that. It wasn't until I, um, studied the work of who are those, the Gottmans in the, uh, and the, their 95% accuracy of who will be married after 15 years. And what they said is if you criticize stonewall or have contempt, you will not be married statistically, um, in after 15 years. And one of the vestiges that I learned, and like, these are learning things. I, I didn't know this because I didn't grow up like that. But I learned that when you roll your eyes, that is contempt. And so they had this uh, video that they shared in the book about this young couple in a room being videoed for this experiment and they wanted to get a dog. She wanted to get a dog. He did not want to get a dog. So that was the conversation in the experiment room. And she rolled her eyes at his opinion. 
And I, my mom rolls her eyes, like, I don't think anymore, but like up until like maybe a couple of years ago, <laughs> she was rolling her eyes at me and I'd be going like, that's contempt. <laughs> so, so I, I think I've had to educate myself, you know, where I didn't know that those kinds of behaviors were inflammatory behaviors and they were so deeply self-protective behaviors. Mm -hmm. So when I come into the womb wisdom, and this is where I'm going to wrap my part up here, but when I come into that womb wisdom, and this is a process because it didn't happen overnight, it's happened over many, many, many years, decades, where that womb is my anchor point and my sense of self that no one really can fuck with it, it because it's just mine and it doesn't, it does, it just is not up for conversation it's just mine. And, and that what am I noticing is that when that get as that gets stronger, then I have more capacity with others. Uh, because over here, what, what have I been defending prior to? I've been defending, you know, my right to exist, my right to have an opinion, my right to be seen, my right to be recognized, my right to be right. But when I already know that who I am is who I am is who I am, then that that's gotten a little like uh, less crusted in that conversation. But I'm not on the mat, so I I also want to acknowledge like you're on the mat, you're in these relationship hotbeds, and the goddess has given me a break so that I could really embody this, so that when I am on the mat, it's like a little bump up in the skill level. So I'm gonna just hand that over to kind of close out what you heard and what that come, what comes to you as we've been having this incredible conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just sort of sitting with this, this piece about um, that we are all swimming in and living in a culture of contempt. Mm -hmm. It's all right there. It's all just, you know, right under the surface and, um, and, you know, how we respond to that contempt either by fighting it or disassociating from it, numbing out from it. It doesn't feel good inside of us when we feel it towards others. It doesn't feel good when others are sending it towards us. And it fails to acknowledge that we are in one ecosystem. And so when we put contempt into the space, doesn't matter who puts it in, everybody's slimed by it. So this, this, um, I think I would just wrap up with what's most alive for me right now is letting go of yet another layer of how I keep myself apart, thinking that's what keeps me safe. When really I have to see with clarity that I'm never apart. I'm always in it. I'm always connected. And so the effort to undo the habits that I was trained in, the, the adaptions I took on to keep myself safe when I was younger, that effort is so important for my own spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical health and well-being. And it has the added benefit of making my relationships healthier. And the truth is, that's where the answer is. As much as we don't want to get dirty, messy, have the conversation, pick up the phone, you know, meet them for tea, the truth is that's where the answer is, because I'm going to go back to what you said. The wounds that we carry are relational wounds. We cannot solve them over here by myself. I'll just handle that. I'm good. Nope. Yeah. All right. Well, this is teeing us up for part two of some more relational ninja work. And, you know, y'all, Rima and I are going to be teaching a course together. You can already tell we love riffing. So you just stay tuned for our course. Thank you, Rima, for on a spur of the moment, getting in the conversation with me. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Lots of love, everyone.